It is the end of 1941. A squadron of Japanese pilots is launched from an aircraft carrier with the command, climb Mount Nitaka. Sunday, December 7th, the infamous day that will drag the United States into World War II. The Japanese air raid on Pearl Harbor will present a devastating example of carrier air power and foreshadow the future of modern naval warfare. Ironically, the surprise attack of these advanced fighter aircraft was almost thwarted by an old mainstay of naval aviation. A PBY patrol flying boat spotted a Japanese submarine less than two miles off the entrance to Pearl Harbor, one hour and 24 minutes before the attack. Acting in accordance with standing orders, the pilot dropped a depth charge on the intruder and reported his actions to base commanders. Unfortunately, it was the old story of the boy who cried wolf. The message was skeptically received and seen as the latest of many false alarms. The rest, of course, is history. Nevertheless, this incident is testimony to the unforgettable role flying boats would play throughout World War II. For anti-submarine warfare, long-range transport, and air-sea rescue, these water birds were indispensable. From twin-engine patrol planes to giant six-engine bombers, they offered versatility and mobility to combatants on both sides of the war. And to its crew, the flying boat offered a distinct way of life and duty unmatched by any other type of aircraft. Although the war's great naval battles would be won by the smaller carrier aircraft, ultimate victory hung in the balance of all naval air operations a partnership that owed its success to the first days of naval aviation long before a carrier had even been built. In 1911, Glenn Curtis had perfected his hydro aeroplane at North Island Naval Base in San Diego, California and delivered the US Navy its first aircraft. But it was the flying boat, developed soon after, that gave the Navy the weapon it needed to cope with the changing face of modern warfare. These larger seaplanes could hold more fuel for extended flights and carry sizable bomb loads. When World War I introduced aerial combat, the flying boat distinguished itself as an aircraft that could patrol vast coastlines and fly far out to sea to attack submarines, the other new weapon of modern warfare a capability that would prove essential in the next world war. This is the U.S. Coast Guard Air Station in San Diego, California, just prior to World War II. Over the last 30 years, the flying boat has become the mainstay of both Coast Guard and Navy patrol. This Hall PH-3 has served the Navy and Coast Guard extremely well throughout the 1930s. With its short takeoff capability and superior rough sea handling, it is ideally suited for air-sea rescue operations. But as a biplane, its days are numbered. Just blocks away from the Coast Guard station, the Consolidated Aircraft Corporation is busy building the latest and greatest addition to the Navy's air patrol wing, the PBY Catalina. Nothing short of right is right. The slogan at the Consolidated plant in San Diego was taken to heart when they built the PBY. With bulkhead compartments, the hull of the PBY resembled a ship more so than an aircraft fuselage. All metal in construction, the PBY was the first of the Navy seaplanes not to be designed with wires, fabric, and glue. 
It sported a high and very large monoplane wing spanning 104 feet that was supported on a pylon-like structure. And its floats were electrically retracted to become wingtips after takeoff, offering an additional streamlined feature. The first production PBY-1 was accepted in 1936. More than 3,300 PBYs would eventually be produced, the largest number of a single flying boat type ever built. The PBY's maximum range far exceeded that of any other Navy plane, nearly 4,000 miles. For the first time, the Navy had an aircraft that could link the U.S. with its Pacific holdings and extend the defense perimeter far out to sea. Those who foresaw the coming of war considered this capability vital to America's security. And as war approached, the Navy began taking its new aircraft straight from the consolidated plant for evaluation. Soon, San Diego Bay was teeming with PBYs. Today, San Diego Bay is still teeming with boats, but none have wings. In fact, today, there is not one flying boat serving in the U.S. Navy or Coast Guard. San Diego Bay has changed in 60 years. The old consolidated sea ramp facility is now a vacant lot. North Island Navy Base has evolved substantially since Glenn Curtis first developed the flying boat. Across the bay, the U.S. Coast Guard Air Station is still in operation. Semper Paratus, always prepared. When America entered World War II, the Coast Guard had been prepared to do its part as a component of the U.S. Navy. Stan Mahoney remembers using its seaplane facility for testing PBYs. We used to taxi our PBYs, which were built right over here at Consolidated, taxi them right down here over this uh, ramp and uh, into the water because they were amphibians. Then we would uh, test the PBYs by taking off San Diego Bay here, and uh, we would uh, probably test about two or three PBYs a day. When we got through with one, we'd go back and get another one, taxi it down, do it all over again. That's uh, kind of a nice remembrance, looking at the old ramp there. It was kind of fun taxiing a PBY across that Harbor Drive and look down and wave at the people as you went by, you know. Uh, kind of brings back memories. The amphibian version of the PBY was delivered to the Navy in 1941. With tricycle landing gear, it could operate from land as well as water. These later models were also configured with transparent waste blisters housing gunner stations with 50 caliber machine guns. With increased production, the PBY set the standard for the Navy's long-range patrol as it could remain aloft for over 18 hours. Meanwhile, Consolidated had been producing its next aircraft for the Navy, the PB-2Y Coronado. This four-engine flying boat was designed to meet the Navy's newest requirement for a large, long-range patrol bomber. While it provided greater cargo space than that of the PBY, the Coronado's deep hull was in fact necessary to facilitate a water takeoff for such a large aircraft. You can get a lot of speed up, but unless you can get it to rocking and break the suction between the hull and the water, you just bounce along like a good boat. And when you get it broken loose, that's when you start picking up speed and get airborne. 
That's where the Coronado had it over the PBY because they had this big square tube that went down and vented the, the step in the hull and uh, give a little air in there to break the suction. That was a big help. Hydrodynamics were as important as aerodynamics, and in designing flying boats, many thought bigger was better. The four-engine Coronado must have been an intimidating sight on San Diego Bay. It was kind of a, of a worry to the people on the sailboats. If they ever got behind us, it was bad news. I remember one day there was a couple of young girls in, in a sailboat, and they taxied up. They sailed their boat right up near us, and as we turned the, the, the Coronado around and to take off, we blew them over. And of course, that was kind of fun because we had to go and, uh, and to get these two young girls out of the water and haul them aboard the Coronado and uh, let them get dried off and uh, right their boat. And they came out from North Island and picked them up. Uh, we'd have taken them along with us, but that wasn't allowed. By the end of the 1930s, war was imminent on both sides of the globe. In the middle stood an isolationist America, adamantly opposed to any foreign entanglements. As the Coronado went into production, and the PBY promised a reliable patrol bomber, U.S. defense planners did the best they could to prepare for war, despite America's isolationist mood. And when war finally came, the flying boat proved both stalwart defender and ferocious attacker. After Great Britain and France declared war on Germany on September 3, 1939, it was not long before Hitler would overrun Northern Europe. In less than one year, England would stand alone against Hitler's Luftwaffe. But with England came the entire British Commonwealth of Nations, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, and South Africans all comprised a fighting force capable of withstanding six years of warfare on both sides of the globe. From the beginning, only the British Navy, key to England's survival, stood in the way of German naval control of the North Atlantic. To keep German raiders from attacking Allied shipping, the Royal Navy would now need the help of reconnaissance aircraft more than ever. Impressed with the PBY's performance, the British had ordered 50 PBY-5s in 1939 and named them Catalinas. The U.S. Navy liked the name and officially adopted it in 1941. In the spring of that year, Catalinas of the Royal Air Force's Coastal Command would deliver the British Navy a decisive victory in the North Atlantic. It is the end of May. The British Navy has been desperately searching for the 45,000-ton German battleship Bismarck, now at large in the North Atlantic. The Bismarck has already demolished one British battle cruiser and poses a serious threat to vital British convoys. RAF Catalinas join the hunt, and on May 26th, a PBY pilot sights the elusive Bismarck. As the Catalinas track the German raider, the British Navy closes in for the kill. While a formidable warship, the Bismarck is no match for Britain's numerical superiority. As she sinks to the bottom, so does Germany's hopes for maintaining a threatening surface navy. Thanks to the vigilance of the Catalina, 
British Coastal Command will continue to protect England's supply line and thereby frustrate Germany's attempts to strangle the British Isles into submission. One of three major RAF operational commands, Coastal Command was charged with maritime reconnaissance. Perhaps no other aircraft epitomized Coastal Command during World War II more so than the Short Sunderland. Built by the Short Brothers Aircraft Company, the Sunderland was an anti-submarine and long-range patrol bomber. The Sunderland's design benefited from the success of its commercial predecessor, the Short S-23C class. Called Empire Flying Boats, they had enabled Imperial Airways to establish vital air links throughout the British Empire. Serving mostly on anti-submarine and long-range reconnaissance patrols, the four-engine Sunderland was a sturdy and dependable workhorse for its 10-man crew. Vic Hodgkinson, a Sunderland skipper of the Royal Australian Air Force, served in the North Atlantic. The Sunderland was a, a very good aircraft. Uh, it took a lot of punishment. Like we didn't, didn't have any armor plate, and later on they put some armor plate around the, around the skipper. Um, it wasn't a fast aircraft, but it had an endurance of, uh, as I say, about 12 hours, the early ones. Uh, it was a good sea boat. It was fairly maneuverable. For a slow airplane, it was, it was quite maneuverable. Maneuverable and considerably armed, the Sunderland could withstand heavy onslaughts from German fighter aircraft, such that the Luftwaffe nicknamed it the Flying Porcupine. It was the first flying boat to be equipped with power-operated bow and tail gun turrets, eight 303 caliber machine guns in all, two at the front, four in the rear, and two at the midsection. Apparently called porcupines because of the amount of armament we, we had on board the aircraft, which was, uh, I suppose, quite a large amount for an aircraft in those days, but really it was very primitive. And the Germans thought we had cannon on board, thank heavens, because uh, they go, normally gave us, a, in my day, gave us a wide berth. <laughs> and, uh, but the, the 303, as I mentioned, uh, had a very poor range against the cannon. Uh, but close in, of course, you had the uh, concentration of uh, firepower. If you get them in close enough, um, uh, then you had a chance of uh, doing some damage. Time was spent avoiding rather than attacking German aircraft. Instead, Sunderland's pursued a more stealthy quarry, the U-boat. Armed with mines, bombs, and depth charges, the Sunderland could be a deadly opponent. But more often than not, the German U-boat outpaced the lumbering Sunderland, stealing below the ocean's surface before damage could be done. This outcome was not entirely unsatisfactory. Submarine work, of course, we flew patterns over an area where the submarines were expected to be, uh, mainly on the roundabout between the 100 fathom line off the coast of France and inshore. We didn't fly much closer than about 50 miles off the French coast. And the idea there was to keep the submarines under the water until they reached the 100 fathom line, which meant that they had to use their batteries. And by the time they got the 100 fathom line, they had to surface anyhow to, to charge them again. So that, that was the reason for that, that exercise. And of course, other times uh, that you met them further out to sea. Although the element of surprise was the U-boat's strong point, it operated best not beneath, but above the water's surface. It could move faster and destroy ships with greater accuracy and firepower. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill once stated that the only thing that ever frightened him during the war was the U-boat threat. With France, Norway, and the Low Countries lost to Hitler's war machine by 1940, the entire Atlantic seaboard from Norway to the Spanish border lay at Germany's disposal. U-boats ranged freely from French Atlantic bases out of the Bay of Biscay and wreaked havoc on British merchant shipping. 
Convoy escorts and their airborne guardians were needed more than ever as the Atlantic lifeline was stretched dangerously thin. In August of 1941, just prior to America's entry into the war, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Winston Churchill meet secretly on the USS Augusta to sign the Atlantic Charter, setting forth the aims of the war against Germany. A peculiar meeting between an active belligerent and a technically neutral country. Under the Lend-Lease Act, the United States has agreed to extend Britain's credit for war supplies, practically committing America's industrial resources to the defeat of Germany. The neutral US was teetering on the edge of war. All that was needed was one final push. The surprise was complete. America's Pacific fleet had been caught sleeping. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor brought World War II, finally, to America's doorstep. All of America was in shock. In San Diego, one naval officer, like all Americans, felt barely prepared, Captain Frank DiLorenzo. Most everybody remembers where they were on the day of Pearl Harbor. Uh, uh, I was in uh, flying for the Navy out of San Diego and a bunch of other bachelors and, and I uh, had a house right in Coronado, California and we were uh, just sitting around a Sunday morning drinking Bloody Marys and we got a telephone call. Uh, the fellow said he was a duty officer and said for us to get down to the squadron right away, the Japs had just bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, we thought it was a gag and hung up the phone and uh, the phone rang back immediately and said, get your butts down to the squadron right now, we're at war. And we turned the radio on and of course it was all full of the day of infamy and uh, uh, we went down to the squadron and uh, mass confusion. Uh, uh, we knew we were at war, we didn't know where the enemy was, uh, but we knew we had to fly. Immediately, attention focuses on America's first line of defense, the coastline. How far off the western coast have the Japanese come? Heavy patrol is imperative. The Coronado is one of the first long-range patrol planes the Navy deploys to guard the vast Pacific coastline. And they put me in uh, one of these Coronados and told me to go down and search the coast of Mexico. Uh, there was a probability, or at least there was a rumor, that the Japanese had a, an amphibious invasion force and were gonna invade the coast of Mexico and then come on up into California. Uh, we took off as we were instructed and flew down the coast of Mexico, all the way down uh, past uh, Guadalupe Island and almost down to Baja, California. And we didn't see a thing. Uh, there were no Japs, there was no nothing. Although there never would be a Japanese invasion of America's coastline, the threat was there and the fear genuine. These large sentinels and other flying boats of World War II became the eyes and ears of the fleet. Coronado could cover 2,300 miles nonstop to look for enemy activity, keeping the Navy alert and ready for mobilization at a moment's notice. Also, its great size could hold a 12,000-pound bomb load for an immediate attack if necessary. Additional duties included Navy personnel transport. Captain DiLorenzo once had the honor of flying Admiral Chester Nimitz to Pearl Harbor soon after the attack in order to take command of what was left of the Pacific Fleet. Over Pearl Harbor, we uh, invited the Admiral up to the flight deck and asked him if he would like to look at the site of what the Japanese had done to our fleet. And of course, he eagerly accepted. And we flew around and made uh, two or three turns around Pearl Harbor and around Hickam Field so he could survey all of the damage. And it, he shook his head and clucked his tongue. It was really a sickening sight. 
the uh, California was sunk, the Utah had completely turned turtle. Her keel was sticking right straight up in the air. The Arizona had settled as where she is today, and uh, there was oil all over Pearl Harbor around Ford Island, a couple of inches thick. Uh, it was one of the most sickening sights that uh, I have ever seen, and, and uh, uh, it's been indelibilized in, in my mind. losses suffered were enormous. Except for the three aircraft carriers that were luckily out at sea, the entire Pacific fleet was damaged or destroyed. All eight battleships were put out of action. Almost all of the aircraft were destroyed. More than 2,400 Americans were killed. Vice Admiral Bull Halsey, commander of the Pacific Carrier Task Force, launches air raids of his own on enemy shore bases to let the Japanese know that America is still a force to be reckoned with. The enemy counterattacks with superior aircraft piloted by more experienced fighters. The Japanese Zero, although lightly armored, is faster and more maneuverable than the American Wildcat. But with time and training, American carrier fighters will gain the experience needed to eventually beat the Japanese at their own game. The age of the carrier aircraft has arrived. Meanwhile, Midway Island stands alone as America's outpost in the Central Pacific. Its continued survival depends largely on flying boats like the PBY. U.S. carrier aircraft will win the epic battle of Midway. But before that battle begins, PBYs will report the advance of Japanese vessels and make the first torpedo attacks before the carrier even launches its first aircraft. Not only military flying boats entered wartime service. The famous Pan Am Clippers that had pioneered the Trans-Pacific Air Routes in the 1930s were caught in mid-flight when Japan turned their Pacific Island bases into a battleground. The Philippine Clipper, sister ship of the famous China Clipper, evacuated Pan Am personnel and passengers from Wake Island and brought the first eyewitness reports of the Japanese attack. Pacific Clipper, a Boeing 314 stationed in New Zealand, was literally cut off from its Pacific route to San Francisco. Crossing deserts and mountains through three continents, it took the long way home, 23,000 miles westward to New York. This first commercial airliner to fly around the world was a superb example of the range and capacity of large flying boats. Safe and sound, the Pan Am Clippers soon were given their new war paint. The elegant Clippers became sturdy war boats, fulfilling the military need for long-range transport aircraft. New naval recruits received special flying boat training from Pan Am crews. Celestial navigation and other skills were passed on by men who had over five years' experience at crossing oceans with flying boats. Pan Am crews themselves took on military status. Often they flew Navy flying boats, as well as their familiar clippers. Their contribution would become an integral part of the Naval Air Transport Service bringing precious supplies overseas with the speed of air power. Another two-engine patrol bomber played an important part in guarding America's coastlines. From the factory of Glenn L. Martin, who had built the famous China Clipper, came the PBM Mariner. This flying boat was more advanced than the older PBY Catalina. Its distinctive gull wing and more powerful engines produced a faster, stronger aircraft. 
The popular PBM-3 version joined the U.S. Navy in the spring of 1942 and served exclusively in the Atlantic against German submarines until late 1943. PBM-3D patrol bomber was equipped with eight 50 caliber machine guns in power turrets at the nose, dorsal, and tail positions. Endowed with airborne radar, it had impressive search capabilities. With an 8,000 pound bomb load capacity, the Mariner effectively and consistently intercepted German U-boats preparing to raid America's Atlantic seaboard. On the other side of the Atlantic, the Sunderland was doing its best to counter the U-boat menace. Sometimes, however, the greatest menace was not met at sea, but upon returning to base. Captain Hugh Birch of the Royal Australian Air Force. The worst thing about flying in out of England was the weather, because, you know, coming back to particularly a place like Oban in Scotland, where we were operating from at one stage, it was like flying up a tunnel at night and the weather was shocking. You know, very, very strong winds and uh, rain, snow. I think a lot of the younger Australian pilots lost their lives coming back uh, to their base in England because they'd all been trained in very good weather here in Australia, you know, on some in Rhodesia and some in Canada where the weather was good. And a lot of them lost their lives before they even got on, onto an enemy raid. In the war between submarine and airplane, direct confrontation was more the exception than the rule. The greatest contribution maritime patrol gave to anti-submarine warfare was air deterrence. The number of U-boats actually sunk or damaged during the war is not high. They were, however, frequently forced to submerge far beneath the ocean's surface and thereby effectively deterred from attacking Allied shipping. When a direct attack could be made, as with this RAF Catalina, the effects were often lethal. The Catalina could hold four 650-pound depth charge bombs and, with a good hit, could seriously cripple or destroy an unlucky U-boat. U-boat patrol, Captain Hugh Birch and his Sunderland crew suffered an unexpected hit of their own. We had one occasion when I was flying in the Bay of Biscay looking for a submarine and we sighted a Dornier flying boat and uh, I decided it was, looked fairly slow, it would be a good idea to attack this, which we did, but suddenly there was a terrible explosion in the, our aircraft and I asked the co-pilot to go down and see what was happening because the front gunner had stopped firing. And uh, we'd been hit by two 20 millimeter cannon shells, one which blew the front off the, the front turret and another one which uh, caused a tear in the side of the, the starboard side of the aircraft about 12 feet long. So the whole airplane became very, very drafty. The, the front gunner was very badly wounded and fell back inside the aircraft and we gave him uh, morphia. And uh, there was a happy ending to the story in that he, he married the nurse who was looking after him in hospital. Like the Sunderland, this German Dornier flying boat was used for maritime reconnaissance. Its regular duties included reporting the locations of Allied shipping to German air bases on the mainland. From there, land-based torpedo bombers would be sent to attack the convoy at sea. Of all of Germany's World War II flying boats, the most impressive was the Blommen Voss BV-238. 
Flying boats are traditionally known for their great size. In this, the BV-238 clearly excelled. An engineer could easily fit inside its massive engine nacelles. Designed for long-range reconnaissance, bomber and armed transport roles, the BV-238 was the largest flying boat ever built during the war. This prototype did not appear for flight tests until the spring of 1944. Before it could take on its bomber form, it was destroyed in a strafing attack by American Mustang fighters. With its long-range capability, the BV-238 could have easily carried its massive bomb load across the Atlantic Ocean had it appeared earlier in the war. Imagine bringing the war in Europe to American soil. The psychological impact to America's morale could have been as damaging as the physical impact to its war industry. World War II might have seen a different outcome. One giant flying boat that the Luftwaffe did have at its disposal was the Blumenvoss BV-222 Viking. Originally built for transatlantic commercial air service, the Viking was adapted for wartime use as a long-range maritime reconnaissance and transport vehicle. Although smaller than the BV-238, the six-engine Viking was the largest flying boat in production and service during World War II. In fact, flying boats like the Viking continued to be the largest type of aircraft in production until the logistical demands of the war finally produced airstrips capable of supporting large land planes. Here, water offers a virtually unlimited runway for the giant Viking's takeoff. Thirteen Vikings were built and served the Germans especially well, flying supplies and troops for use in North Africa. In British Africa, crude airstrips were hacked out of the thick jungle so that Allied land planes could maintain supply lines across the continent. While in West Africa, a flying boat base had been built with arguably less effort. Sunderlands operated off coastal waters in part for anti-submarine patrol. But they also flew huge shipments of supplies to East Africa, including Alexandria and other British seaports. The versatile Sunderland was not alone in this air transport role. The U.S. Navy used its large flying boats, like this PBM Mariner, for specific duty under the Naval Air Transport Service. Every war has been influenced by logistics. Success in the battlefield always depends on the strength of supply lines. Although the majority of Allied war supplies were carried in ships, a small but vital portion was flown in aircraft. Many Coronados and PBM Mariners were configured for transporting high-priority items from manufacturers in the United States to needy forces overseas. From propeller blades to band-aids, or just mail from home, these big flying boats could carry it all to the most remote parts of the world. And men perhaps the most important cargo, battle-weary soldiers and sailors going home. In a matter of hours rather than days, these long-range flying boats carried men back to their families across the oceans that had separated them for so long. By the end of 1942, U.S. General Joseph Stilwell was busy combating the Japanese army in Southeast Asia. Under his command, U.S. and Chinese nationalist forces fought to keep the Japanese from controlling all of Burma, a country wedged between China and India. The 
thick jungle terrain was a logistical nightmare. Huge amounts of machinery and manpower were required to carve out roads and airfields, which were essential to keeping China well supplied. But if both the Japanese and the jungle were not enough of an obstacle, the weather was. The rainy season brought heavy monsoons that flooded rivers, rendering freshly built roads and airfields practically useless. Under these conditions, the air supply to China became extremely difficult. These land-based planes were virtually immobilized in the war effort against Japan. Not so for their waterborne cousins. By mid-1943, the Allies had stemmed the Japanese tide in the Pacific, and with the air support of PBY Catalinas, they began taking back the islands they had lost. The nights were soon filled with the growl of black cats. The legendary PBYs painted coal black for camouflage in nighttime raids. As Allied forces chipped away at Japan's empire by day, the black cats moved with them, knocking out enemy airfields and supply lines by night. Operating from hastily prepared bases in hidden lagoons, these cats highlighted the merit of flying boats. Especially as the island hopping campaign toward Japan progressed. The battles were long and hard. It took months of bloody fighting through the Solomon Islands before the Japanese were finally forced out of Guadalcanal. U.S. naval and marine forces fought for every island inch, but the Japanese continued to be resupplied by the infamous Tokyo Express, a supply line of warships and cargo vessels that stole through the night and refreshed beleaguered Japanese defenses. This is where the Black Cats made their mark. As daylight faded, the cats took off into the night, armed with fresh rounds of ammunition and 4,000 pounds of torpedoes, bombs, or depth charges. They faced little opposition under the shroud of darkness. The slow-moving Catalinas were vulnerable to anti-aircraft and fighter attack during the day. But at night, fitted with airborne radar, they were stealthy and aggressive hunters. The Japanese, who did not have radar, were often unaware of a black cat approach before it was too late. Hunting in packs, the black cats pounced on exposed enemy ships, often with devastating results. Constant nighttime attacks like this left little room for reinforcement to Japanese troops. Throughout 1943 and 1944, the cats helped neutralize counterattacks against the gradual advance of Allied forces. Many Marines owed much of their success to black cat operations. And the cat crews knew who to thank, the old reliable PBY. Its ruggedness and durability could absorb heavy anti-aircraft fire and still limp home, sometimes with only one engine running. And if necessary, it could always make a safe water landing. The versatile cats clearly earned their keep. One of the most remarkable flying boats of the war was Japan's Kawanishi H-8K2, codenamed Emily by the Allies. Little film record still exists, but this home movie offers a glimpse of the fastest flying boat in service during World War II. Armed with five 20 millimeter cannons, the Emily was greatly respected by Allied fighter pilots. And with their long range capability, these heavy bombers were once sent to attack Pearl Harbor in March of 1942. The mission was called off, however, due to thick cloud cover over Hawaii. Three months following that abortive attack, Japan's chances for any further advance in the Central Pacific were destroyed at the Battle of Midway.
before the first shot was fired, U.S. fleet commanders had known that the battle would be won in the sky, not on the sea. In the end, the U.S. Navy won its first decisive victory in which the aircraft carrier was the essential instrument. Over the next three years, the carrier task force would lead the Allies to victory in the Pacific War. The writing was on the wall. The future of naval aviation lay with carrier air power. When these air battles were over, the less glamorous aircraft, the pioneers of naval aviation, had one last duty to perform scour the watery battlefield for the hopeful survivor gone down in his plane. For air-sea rescue, the flying boat was hard to beat. Hundreds of downed pilots escaped a watery death thanks to the reliable PBY. And perhaps hundreds more owe their thanks because these patrol planes better prepared the fleet for battle with advanced reconnaissance. Flying boats would slowly fade away from naval aviation. But many lived to remember those ungainly waterbirds long after progress would forget them. Stan Mahoney does more than remember. As a flight engineer on both the PBY and Coronado during the war, his affection for the flying boat surfaces in a variety of ways. When he's not revisiting his old stomping grounds at San Diego Bay, he indulges in his favorite hobby. I always did like to draw pictures of airplanes, even when I was a kid in school. In fact, I even got in trouble for drawing pictures. And uh, so when I was in PSA, they used to tell me, why don't you draw those pictures when you retire and uh, take them, sell them at the airlines, at the air shows. So that's how come I started drawing these uh, airplane pictures and, and uh, they do, they sell them at the air shows. And it's been a very uh, enjoyable hobby. And I also like to write. I write uh, all kinds of stories and even wrote a book called I'm in Aviation Now. It gets a whole story about all this kind of flying, illustrated by myself. This is a drawing I did of a sort of an exploded view showing the interior of a PBY, starting off with your uh, uh, gun station up in the bow and then the bombardier station you can see there and the pilot stations in, inside. Then you come to the radioman on the right-hand side of the, of the hull. And on this side in this picture is the navigator station. And then you go through a bulkhead into the next compartment. And the flight engineer is up in his little cubicle above the hull, clear up above it, with a window on each side. That was really neat. You had a window on the right, right next to your shoulder, and a window on the left, next to your left shoulder. You could look out either way, but you couldn't look forward because all your instruments were right forward. Aft of that is the uh, bunk room, and then aft of that, there's another bulkhead there. After that is the two blisters where the gunners were stationed with the 50 caliber guns. Then aft of that, there's another bulkhead. After that is a tunnel hatch, which could be opened, and there was a 30 caliber gun back there as well. As with all flying boats, PBY crews shared a special affection for their aircraft. Part plane, part boat. Its missions took them where no other aircraft could go. And life on board brought a feeling of being part of something unique. 
all flying boat pilots regarded themselves as a race apart. And uh, we used to uh, develop the myth of uh, the uh, flying boat crews. And uh, as somebody once wrote to its crews, the Sunderland was much more than just a, a good machine. It represented a wholly uh, distinct way of life. As with no other aircraft used by the Royal Air Force, it became war chariot, home, bed and board to the men who flew in it. A unique relationship between man and machine firmly established from the very beginning with its highly esoteric way of life and attitudes. The near naval terminology in everyday speech and by no means least, an extraordinarily close comradeship. Once airborne, a Sunderland was literally a self-contained war unit of men and machine with a breadth of possible situations and actions unknown to any land plane. So I think that's a fairly good description of uh, <laughs> the flying boat union. crew members were just like a family. They, um, they all knew one another. They knew their families. They knew what their families at home were. And each member of the crew had specific duties and some could do some things better than others. Like one guy could be a better cook. Another could be better at grabbing the buoy. Maybe he could hang out there and grab the buoy better than someone else. And we all worked together. With the Japanese surrender in 1945, a war ends in which the flying boat faces an uncertain future. The aircraft carrier has succeeded the battleship as the primary naval attack ship and has become the new champion of naval aviation. While World War II was the flying boat's finest hour, it was also the beginning of the end. The increasing availability of fixed airstrips built for use in the war and the advantages of operating aircraft from such facilities signaled the demise of both a military and commercial flying boat. Fifty years later, the flying war boats are still flying. Through the spirit and in the memories, of the men who flew them. When Stan Mahoney flips through his old blog book, the flying boat is alive once again. If this goes back to the first flights I made in a PBY. You look in here and see where you did something that, that brings the story back. So then I turn around and write this story in a book. It, it kind of helps you to uh, enjoy life, see? After all, you know, I'm, I'm getting up there, see? I'm 82, so <laughs> kind of keep me going.